Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Justin O'Brien. I'm the CEO of the Conjakemi Aboriginal Corporation. I've worked uh, for the Mirar traditional owners here in Jabiru and Kakadu for about 20 years. The Mirar are the traditional owners of the Ranger Project area and the Jabaluka Mineral Lease, as well as the township of Jabiru and parts of Kakadu National Park and Western Arnhem Land. This corporation was established in 1995 uh, and immediately found itself pitted in a David and Goliath struggle against mining at Jabaluka, but more of that later. My job today is a brief one. It's just to introduce Chris Brady and Peter Christofferson. Chris Brady is an environmental scientist who spent uh, uh, the better part of 20 years in the Northern Territory, working mostly with and for Aboriginal people, and today he works with the Northern Land Council. Peter Christofferson uh, of Kakadu Native Plant Supplies is an Aboriginal contractor with extensive Indigenous land management experience in the top end, and he's intimately associated for many years with our attempts here at Conjakemi to ensure that the rehabilitation of the range of mine is effective, both environmentally and culturally, within the measly five years that it's currently provided for. That is quite the task. The disturbed area of the mine, and you can see that image here, is large. You'll see from this tailing storage facility, that is one kilometre in width. We have billions of litres of contaminated water, um, uh, millions of tonnes of, of waste rock upstream of uh, internationally protected wetlands and Aboriginal communities. This mine was originally established uh, by overriding local Aboriginal opposition under Commonwealth ownership. 50% of the mine was then owned by the Commonwealth. It went on to operate for 40 years, producing 130,000 tonnes of uranium oxide. Mining ended in 2012 and milling just ceased last month. We're in the rehab phase now. The Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory was a double-edged sword for people here. It delivered land rights uh, and with that a veto over any development on any land granted, except in the case of the range of uranium mine, uh, where the veto was especially carved out because of the Commonwealth ownership of the, of the asset. Ranger is totally surrounded by the World Heritage List of Kakadu National Park. That's Australia's largest national park, one of only 32 worldwide listed for both natural and cultural values, and the site of Australia's oldest human occupation site at Mudjibibi, at least 65,000 years of occupation there. Now, in August 2000, Rio Tinto acquired a gaining uh, seeking to gain control of iron ore assets in the Pilbara, they gained a majority stake in ERA. At the time, uh, we expected to have mercenaries overrun us and uh, further mining pushed upon us, like in Bougainville. Instead, uh, we found after first trying to sell ERA, Rio Tinto admirably deal with the nightmarish history of Ranger by ultimately entering into an agreement with the Mirar and the Northern Land Councils to never mine Jabaluka, the site of the protest, without written consent. Now, that's true free prior and informed consent, uh, a high watermark in relations between the resource sector and Aboriginal people worldwide. That was entered into in, uh, in February 2005. Today, the major test for Rio is to address the challenge of rehabilitation and such that this area can be included into the World Heritage List of Kakadu. After the travesty of the destruction of the uh, Jukun Cave in the Pilbara, the world is watching Rio Tinto, of course. Now, Chris and Peter here are pivotal in working with the traditional owners to position the TOs in, in regard to rehab and restoring the country back to them. They're spearheading a project with Mirar to capture the values that traditional owners wish to see restored at Ranger and articulating those values in a way recognisable to Western environmental science, ways that an engineer can plan for. It's a remarkably innovative and practical way of giving traditional ecological knowledge practical effect. For this work has to inform the closure criteria against which Rio Tinto's rehabilitation will be measured. We aim for that, what we call cultural closure criteria, to become a uh, enforceable part of the regulatory system. We're not quite there yet. The state and the mining company still privilege Western environmental science values at the expense and over and above traditional values. Cultural considerations should be included alongside other criteria for closure, such as water, land form, revegetation and radiation. Chris will now address some of the background and challenges to this type of cross-cultural work, highlighting the importance of cultural values and successful rehabilitation. 
And after that, Peter will provide you with an insight into a, a proposed practical application of those values as part of the mine's rehabilitation. At that, I'll hand over to Chris Brady. Thanks very much. Thank you, Justin. I'm going to provide some background to some proposed work to facilitate cultural reconnection in the Ranger project area, where uranium production ceased just a few weeks ago. First, I want to talk a little about mine closure and land rights in the Northern Territory. Mining inevitably leads to change, creation of hills, voids, changes to water. And change is really important to Aboriginal people whose tradition teaches a created and interconnected landscape. In recognition of negative impacts from former mines, the Northern Territory Government established a legacy mine unit in 2013, estimating there is a liability of over $1 billion for remediation of old mine sites. This does not include the cost of loss of productivity and values. Note this photo here is not of snow. This is a mine site in the tropics near Pine Creek in the Northern Territory. Among the most notorious of the legacy mine sites is the Red Bank Copper Mine. Poor construction and planning has resulted in the release of polluted water for decades. The Northern Territory Government held a bond of just $150,000. In 2013, the NT Mines Minister promised traditional owners remediation of this site was a priority. They are still waiting for action. Traditional owner Keith Rory said, we have grandchildren and kids coming up. We need a future. The mine needs to do the right thing by the people. Our young kids need to get on country, hunting and fishing. They can't be frightened of contamination. We need to make sure that the country is safe for our young people to go back to, to work, to hunt, to live on, on the land of their grandfathers and grandmothers. It's enough about legacy mines. The point I'm trying to make is that the NT has not dealt well with mine closure. As half the land in the Northern Territory belongs to Aboriginal people, the impacts of the legacy often falls to them. Any attempt at mine rehabilitation should consider how Aboriginal people view and use the land. In 1998, I was fortunate to receive a scholarship to undertake a study called Birds as Indicators of Rehabilitation Success at Gove Mine Sites. The Gove Mine Sites are in eastern Arnhem Land, an important place in the history of land rights in Australia. I took a very scientific approach to the study, making detailed counts and measures across replicate sites. I found as many birds and similar species richness between old rehabilitation areas and the surrounding bush, although the species mix differed. This could be considered functional restoration, a success. I asked an Aboriginal lady what she thought. She told me the area is where stringy barks camp. The rehabilitation had stringy barks, but it also had other eucalypts. As an ecologist, these were local species and they provide ecosystem services. To this particular lady, mixing up of species was of great concern. It could mix up the dreaming of the people responsible for the place, leading to social dysfunction, which she witnessed in the community. So one's cultural perception is crucial to what is a significant impact and what would be seen as rehabilitation success. Mirar traditional owner, Yvonne Margarula's father, made it clear when mining at Ranger was proposed that he was worried about potential impacts, disturbance of dangerous sacred places that he was obliged to protect could have on other people, that it could lead to disaster. In April 2011, following the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster in Japan, Yvonne wrote to the UN Secretary General to express her sorrow for the impacts radiation was having on the lives of Japanese people. This photo is of a meeting that Yvonne had with one of those Japanese people, a farmer who lost all his cattle in the disaster, who subsequently came and visited Jabiru. The disturbance of sacred places in Australia causing a disaster in Japan is probably not how an objective scientist 
would view the Fukushima disaster. But it is a totally logical interpretation within the worldview of the mirror. With 40 years of mining at Ranger, there has been total destruction of the pre-mining landscape. Jokmara Billabong is forever lost. This is just upstream from world-renowned wetlands where Aboriginal people have their homes and hunting grounds. Mudgeonberry Billabong, you can see in the centre of the slide here, is the largest outstation of Aboriginal people in Kakadu. Now, within the five-year legislated period for rehabilitation, there remains significant uncertainty, such as the level of contamination that will remain in and beneath the ground. Is there sufficient funds? And what will happen when the legislative period for closure expires? However, there is a lot of positive progress being made towards the closure of the mine. ERA have funded work for traditional owners to develop cultural closure criteria, perhaps new for the mining industry. The criteria consider the binning worldview and land use, the desires of people to again use the land for hunting and gathering, recreation, land management and ritual. The criteria are an attempt to put these desires in terms scientists, engineers and regulators can use in planning and assessing the rehabilitation. I now invite Peter, an Aboriginal man with connection to West Arnhem Land in Kakadu, to talk about a proposed plan to include Indigenous knowledge and perspective into rehabilitation design that we believe will facilitate Aboriginal people reconnecting with this landscape where their family have lived for millennia. And over to Peter, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So really uh, my job is to try and facilitate how uh, Aboriginal people can work with uh, the Western Science uh, Group and look at ways in which we can um, achieve practical outcomes to achieve everybody's objectives. And so going back on what Chris mentioned about how we see uh, the world around us. We're interrelated uh, with all plants, animals, places, um, ceremony, rocks, moon, sun. We all have a relationship and a place within the environment. So basically on the first photo, we can see up on the top left, these are natural outcrops and these natural outcrops uh, provide some resistance to fire and often you find quite unique uh, flora existing there which then uh, attract quite unique uh, animals. The next picture down is of a small micro bat. And so over time, the idea is that we can give Aboriginal people an opportunity to look at country and how they'd like to perhaps integrate their knowledge into the final rehab. So I went around the park and just took a few photos of outlying rocky uh, outcrops just to give Aboriginal people or the Mirad an opportunity to revitalise some of their knowledge of these areas. And basically, we would look at what animal they want to see or what animal would exist in those areas and then start to drill down on what plants uh, we would need to put in there to facilitate those animals coming back. But not only that, understanding the relationship between each plant selected, so the kinship relationship between the plant the animal, ourself, and the place. So um, just the, the three photos there depict three different uh, environments. We have a, a floodplain system on the left. Uh, again, quite unique plants existing there. We have a monsoon thicket in the middle and an open woodland area on the right. And each of these can play a role in the different uh, areas of the mine rehab. Drier woodland areas, more riparian or monsoonal thickets, and uh, perhaps a, a drier, wetter area. And um, the rock size can vary, so quite large rock islands to lower flat ground or lower slopes. Uh, scattered rocks can be arranged on ridge lines and they can provide uh, erosion control to those areas. Also, there's going to be some quite large runoff occur. I don't know where they are, but um, eventually uh, we could use um, the hardening of, of uh, rocks to curb and manage uh, runoff. So with this slide at the bottom but not shown, there's a, a very sacred uh, site known as Jitby Jitby and it refers to the uh, resting place of the King Brown. 
that story of his travels uh, emanates through northwards, uh, through that mine area. And basically what I looked at was how do we continue with that story by using rock formations to one, cater for traditional plantings and shelter for small mammals and birds and so forth, but also provide that link with the outside area of the mine through and keep those travels going through to the other side. I guess trying to provide continuity between the outside and the inside of that mine both for a, uh, a story, uh, for the sacred story of that place, um, for the uh, plants and animals and for people as well. So the benefits here is that um, we would give meaningful uh, engagement to the mirror in uh, designing the landform. We would uh, really look at um, reconnecting people with country, which has been a difficult aspect uh, throughout the 40 years, uh, people have stayed away and not participated in any of that work. And now it gives them uh, an opportunity to participate there. Really about developing niche planting areas that cater for uh, specific animals, plants and people. I guess the main issue here is that over time, these niche habitats will start to develop and hopefully bringing back the different uh, fauna that the traditional owners would expect. And I guess this would form part of the long-term uh, monitoring uh, program that uh, I hope that the Mirada could be involved in. And the last point here is that most landforms that I've visited of mine sites that have been re-established have been featureless. And again, this provides some feature that um, people can relate to. Thank you.